Welcome to the Group of 78 podcast. This podcast is a recording of our luncheon series from April 24th, 2018, titled How to Stop Corporate Tax Dodging. It was recorded in Ottawa, Ontario. Dennis Howlett will talk about whether and how practices of global tax evasion can be stopped, like those that were revealed in the wake of the Panama and Paradise Papers scandals which uncovered global tax evasion on a massive scale and increasing evidence of tax avoidance by the world's largest corporations. If you would like more information about our upcoming or past events, please visit www.group78.org. Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Um, So I just want to say a few things before um, introducing our speaker. I just wanted to tell you about some upcoming uh, events. Um, Our next lunch talk will be on May the 29th, featuring Irvin Waller, professor of criminology at the University of Ottawa, on how Canada can become a world leader in preventing personal violence. We shall have the notice of his talk up on the website uh, in short order. So I was just... um, emailing Irvin this morning uh, to get some of the details. So keep your eye on the website for that notice. We have another special event coming up, uh, as we did last week, with um, Hossein Musavian, uh, Ambassador Musavian from Iran. Um, Next uh, special event will be in June, June the 13th, featuring Michael Link, who's at the University of Western Ontario law faculty, but uh, more to the point, he's UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in the Palestinian Territory, and he'll be talking about the implications of the human rights situation for the Israel-Palestine conflict. So that's from 7 to 9 p.m. June the 13th. Uh, Stay tuned for for details on that. And then, of course, uh, there's our annual flagship uh, event, which is our annual conference. Um, the title of our annual conference is Meeting the Climate Challenge, Accelerating the Transition to a Post-Carbon World. Um, the, the conference committee has been working very hard over these past weeks and months to put together a program, and I'm delighted to uh, mention that uh, we have succeeded in securing as our keynote speaker uh, Joanna Kerr, who's the executive Uh, Director of uh, Greenpeace Canada. So Joanna will be kicking things off on um, the Friday evening. uh, That's September the 28th. In fact, uh, we have uh, an event uh, just the prior evening to that on September the 27th when we'll have a special screening of a film, Anot's Ark, uh, at the Mayfair Cinema. So this is something new for the group of 78 to have a a film event in advance of our conference event. And I hope it will serve to bring people together and uh, excite them for the upcoming uh, conference the next day. Okay, so on to our our main event for today. It's, of course, um, the end of April, uh, which is the time to do what? (laughs) You may be laughing now. (laughs) Of course, uh, yeah, I just filed my income taxes, and I think I've just about recovered. Uh, but it, it'll take a, li- a little bit longer. But, okay, so here's a skill testing question. Who said the following? Taxes are what we pay for civilized society. And you can't answer. <laughs> Any, anyone have a go at that? Taxes are what we pay for a civilized society. <laughs> Close. He could have if, if, he, if he was there at the right time. No, it was actually U.S. Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes in a court case in 1927. And there's a lot of wisdom in what uh, Justice Holmes had to say. Uh, all you have to do is to think about the spectacular revelations in the last few years of tax evasion on a massive global scale. In 2015, an anonymous source leaked the so-called Panama Papers, some 
11.5 million confidential documents detailing financial information pertaining to more than 214,000 offshore entities. Many of these were legal, but many were also used to hide fraud and tax evasion. And then a couple of years later, just in November 2017, another spectacular leak of 13.4 million confidential documents, the so-called Paradise Papers. These revealed financial information about more than 120,000 individuals and corporations, many using tax havens to avoid billions of dollars in taxes. And by the way, three of the names that emerged in the Paradise Papers were three uh, recent Prime Ministers of Canada. Uh, I'm sure that Dennis will have a bit more to say about this. Even if we disregard these illustrations of fraudulent tax avoidance, the huge tax cuts for corporations and the rich by Trump and the Republican Congress have dangerous spillover effects. In Canada, the business lobby has been clamoring ever since for tax cuts to remain competitive with the U.S. <coughs> okay, so we've seen this movie before, and we know how it ends. Tax cuts lead to deficits, and deficits lead to public expenditure cuts in health, education, social security, and other public sector goods and services, save perhaps for the military. They seem to get away from these things. In other words, to paraphrase Justice Holmes, civilized society pays a price for tax cuts. So think of that when you're filing your tax returns. Furthermore, both tax cutting and expenditure cutting contribute to widening inequalities as the rich reap most of the benefits of the cuts and the poor and the middle class get burdened with most of the costs of expenditure cuts. So what, if anything, can be done to arrest these practices and beliefs so corrosive to societies around the world? Can the financial genie be put back into its bottle? To answer these impossible questions, we're lucky to have with us today Dennis Howlett to shed some light on the way forward. So briefly, Dennis is the retiring executive director of Canadians for Tax Fairness. Dennis has done some remarkable work during his tenure as executive director uh, of that organization. He's helped uh, to, for example, shed a lot of light on tax evasion and has been involved uh, with uh, the CBC in a famous Fifth Estate program which aired, uh, when, a year or so ago? Yep. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure it's on YouTube. I hope KPMG. it is. It involved uh, KPMG facilitating tax evasion by Canadian tax filers. But going back a bit, Dennis has helped to launch campaigns uh, to roll back corporate tax cuts, tax havens, and close tax loopholes. And for this, he's frequently called as an expert witness for the House of Commons Finance Committee and is often quoted in print and electronic media. And unlike, unlike some of my colleagues here, he's had a receptive ear by the government and the Department of Finance to some of his findings and insights on tax issues. Uh, others have a different story to tell in their interactions with the government of Canada, unfortunately. But uh, for over 30 years, Dennis has worked for a number of ecumenical social justice coalitions, including 10 Days for Global Justice, the Ecumenical Coalition for Economic Justice, and Kairos, where he led successful campaigns for cancellation of third world debt, fair trade certification of coffee and other products, and ratification of the Kyoto Protocol on climate change. And one thing that many people might uh, remember and know Dennis about is the Make Poverty History campaign, which he headed up in Canada uh, from about 2005 or six on for the next few years. So uh, please welcome Dennis Howlett. <laughs> Thank you, and before I begin, I should give acknowledgement to John Foster here, who is an old and dear friend who actually started me in this area of work. He hired me. <laughs> My first job at the Gatfly, as it was called then, 
later became Ecumenical Coalition for Economic Justice. And so I owe my start in this line of work to John Foster. So thank you, John. <laughs> Good to see you again. Um, well, it is tax filing time. And if you haven't filed your taxes, you've got like a few more days to do it. And that's it. Uh, I actually just wrote a, a blog a few weeks ago for Huffington Post on ways that we could make tax uh, tax filing more uh, enjoyable. <laughs> and we've actually seriously put this recommendation forward to the government. The NDP has picked it up, uh, but the government is considering it. Anyway, in the Scandinavian countries, the tax authorities do your taxes for you. And there's no reason why they couldn't do it here as well. For most people, the government already knows how much you make. Their employ your employer sends the information. Uh, any donations you make, the charities have to report who donated. Any uh, benefits or other things you receive, the government knows what you get. So really, they've got all the information they need to be able to do the taxes for you. And in Norway, they just send you a draft and say, is this OK? And you go through it and sign off, and it's done. Uh, so there is a way to make tax filing a lot easier. Uh, but from our point of view, it's also important because a lot of benefits are tied to the tax system. And we still have a big problem in Canada of child uh, the Canada Child Benefit, for example, um, you have to file a tax return in order to get the child benefit, even if you have an income uh, lower than, you know, you would have to pay any taxes. And so as a result, uh, some of the families living in poverty uh, who need the child benefit the most aren't getting it. And especially uh, in indigenous communities where the tax filing rate is very low, about 50%. It means about half the children in indigenous communities who are poor, and that's where the highest rate of child poverty is. They're not getting the one most effective instrument we have for uh, combating child poverty. So again, this is something you have to keep pushing away. I am hoping Canada will catch up to the Scandinavian countries on this, make it easier for everybody, but also ensure everybody who is entitled to benefits are able to get these uh, benefits. So that's another thing we're working on. Um, we have had uh, some success since 2011 when Canadians for Tax Fairness was launched. Um, Back then, the debate about taxes was really dominated by the whole idea of tax cuts. And tax cuts could solve various uh, problems. So a tax cut for um, children's sports, a tax cut for um, public transit, a tax cut for this, <laughs> a tax cut for um, supposedly for daycare, although it never really worked out that way. The problem being that for lower income people who don't pay any taxes, none of these things were of any use to them at all. And tax cuts disproportionately benefit the very wealthy. But the tax cuts were an easy way to, um, you know, it was popular because who isn't happy about getting a few extra dollars? Even though for most ordinary people, you might get a couple hundred dollars at most from a tax cut, whereas the rich would get several thousand dollars. But as Roy said, it was really very deliberate strategy by Harper to create deficits that would justify cutting social programs. Harper hated Canadian welfare state. He really thought that was... Um, terrible. And so he knew that attacking uh, 
Medicare head on would be politically disastrous. So he led with the tax cut agenda. But we've managed, I think, uh, over a few years to change the conversation to tax fairness. And in fact, even starting with uh, some of the conservative budgets, when Jim Flaherty was the finance minister, um, we actually had federal budgets with whole chapters on tax fairness. And that has continued. I've worked in this uh, social justice field for many, many years. I've gone to um, the budget lockups <laughs> when I was working on poverty issues and on the churches. And you were lucky if you found a sentence or two in the budget you know, related to your concerns. Imagine my surprise when I went into budget lockup and, oh my goodness, there's a whole chapter on tax fairness. And this actually started with Jim Flaherty, who did implement some of our recommendations around uh, tax havens. Um, but we have managed to change the conversation to tax fairness. And uh, the Liberal government has actually done quite a bit to go after wealthy individuals using tax havens uh, to evade taxes. But what they haven't done yet, and the remaining challenge for us, is corpora corporations using tax havens to lower their taxes. Now, most of what corporations do in terms of using tax havens um, is legal. So there are various ways that they can do this. And I'll just give you a few examples. Uh, what they do is they set up a subsidiary in a tax haven. Uh, tax havens are countries that either have very low taxes or a lot of secrecy. So you can register a, a, a shell company or a company, you know, with the names you have for it are trustees, and so you don't really know who the real owner is. Uh, various ways to cover your tracks. In the case of corporations, what they do is they set up a subsidiary and then they would um, use the subsidiary to as an intermediary for selling their products. So the best example of this is Cameco. Do you know who Cameco is? Canadian uranium mining company based in Saskatoon. They, uh, all the uranium comes from Canada, but they set up a subsidiary in Switzerland where the tax rate is only 10% as compared with 26% in Canada. And they signed a long-term uh, agreement with their subsidiary that the Canadian parent company would sell uh, their uranium to this subsidiary for $10 a pound. And this subsidiary would then market the uranium to the ultimate customers. Well, guess what? The price of uranium went up to uh, over $100 a pound. <laughs> it's down a bit now, about $30 a pound, you know, after um, the the Fukushima disaster and so on. But still, most of the profit then was kept in the offshore subsidiary where they only had two staff. So all the work, all the marketing work was still all being done from Canada. But the profits were all booked in Switzerland uh, where the tax rate is much lower. Uh, they are being charged in court now, and the court case is dragged on and on and on, but they're charged with evading $2 billion in taxes. $2 billion. We still don't know yet what the final result would be, but at least in this case, it's a little easier for the Canadian government to make a case because there is a world market price for uranium. And you can say, this doesn't stand the test of what's supposed to be an arm's length relationship. So even within 
related companies, any transaction should be uh, comparable to what would happen uh, between companies that aren't related. That's the rule. And it would be pretty easy, I hope, that they can prove that this is a flagrant violation of that. And they could be on the hook for over $2 billion. That's just one company. But it becomes more complicated when companies sell their intellectual property to their subsidiaries. So this is things like patents, drug patents or technology patents, or even the brand name, the logo of the company. Uh, Nike and Apple and you know, all these other companies, um, Starbucks, they all do this. So every, uh, the parent company or the Canadian company has to pay a fee to the offshore subsidiary for the use of the patents or the trademark. And that's a way to shift money offshore so that there's less profit here in Canada to be declared and less taxes to be paid. Another thing uh, resource companies do a lot and we're trying to research Chevron, which has been um, convicted in Australia of doing this, and we know that they do the same thing in Canada, is they borrow money from their subsidiary offshore. And they actually pay a much higher interest rate than they would if they borrowed money from a Canadian bank or a local uh, source. But again, that's a way to shift money offshore. So they use all these tactics to shift their money, shift their profits offshore where then they can declare very low profits in Canada and uh, you know pay less taxes. So this is a huge problem. In fact, we just published a report uh, last November called Bay Street and Tax Havens, uh, Curbing Corporate Tax Addiction. And we found that of the TSX 60, the largest 60 publicly traded companies, uh, all but four of them had offshore subsidiaries. And some of them had a lot of subsidiaries. Um, uh, let me just see the examples here. Um, we had 472 uh, Tax uh, subsidiaries registered in Delaware, 81 in Barbados, 71 in Bermuda, 66 in the Netherlands, 49 in Luxembourg, 46 in Hong Kong, uh, Cayman Islands, Bahamas, and so on. Um, and, and all of the big Canadian companies, except for four, had uh, offshore subsidiaries. They, um, they also, later this week, on, what's today, Tuesday, on Thursday, the Statistics Canada will be releasing their annual report on foreign direct investment. And we've been following this for the last few years, and we found that the amount of Canadian direct investment abroad going to tax havens has been going up and up and up. Uh, it used to be only $21 billion in 1994, and uh, la in 2016, it was $284 billion. Now, some of this might be, you know, a resort or a golf course in Bermuda or Barbados or something like that, but most of it is uh, just in shell companies, just like the chemical example. So here's the graph of it going up over the years. Uh, there was a slight dip last year, and we're waiting to see if that's just a blip or if it's actually going to be a trend. Uh, we think it could have been partly because of uh, the value of the Canadian dollar, but Ireland did tighten up their policies around tax havens. So it could be some of the public um, campaigning and policy changes 
have resulted in, in a decline. So we'll wait and see if that proves to be the case. Um, but the uh, report on Thursday, uh, we'll see if, if this trend continues. But what we've also done is research showing that the number of employees per dollar of investment is completely uh, different for, um, for tax havens versus a legitimate um, investments. So in subsidiaries in non-tax haven countries, employed about between 1,200 to 2,700 employees per $1 billion in assets. So when it's a legitimate investment, it's actually, you know, creating jobs. But in tax havens, subsidiaries employed from one employee to a maximum of 250. So the 250 might be, you know, there was actually a resort or something in one of these Caribbean islands. But most of them are, uh, and you can see on this chart, these are all the tax haven countries. And, you know, the, the number of staff per billion dollar of investment is very low. And the minute you get to Mexico, Malaysia, China, Germany, you know, more non-tax haven countries, you have much higher numbers of employees. So that's a proxy to show that most of the in this investment is not actually what we would call economic substance. It's just a, a paper company or a shell company. And it's mainly investments done in order to avoid taxes. So um, what can be done about this? Um, but maybe before getting into that, the big question is, what can we do about it? That's what you've asked me to talk about. Let me just say one word about what is it costing us. Uh, again, it's hard to get an exact figure, but based on the Paradise Papers reports, um, and some of the research that was done on that by the Tax Justice Network, our colleagues in the UK, uh, I've calculated that Canada is likely losing between 10 to $15 billion a year just from the corporate tax dodging. That doesn't include the individual, uh, wealthy individuals using tax havens. And if you look at some of the global studies that have been done, uh, we estimate that about two-thirds of the problem is corporate. The majority of that is actually through legal channels. And one-third of it is wealthy individuals, and almost all of that is illegal tax evasion. So 10 to 15 of just the corporate part of it is being lost in uh, revenue uh, for the federal and provincial governments. What this means is that the government has less money available to invest in things like pharmacare or daycare or other uh, investments. And, you know, the Liberal government has, you know, run up a bit of a deficit to invest in infrastructure and other things. But they've kind of reached their limit for what they could do in terms of um, deficit investment. So... If they're serious about actually rolling out a pharmacare plan, which they've just debated uh, this past weekend at their liberal convention, if they're serious about doing something about child care, um, then they need more revenue to be able to fund uh, some of these things. And it would be possible, uh, without having to raise taxes on the general public, if they just went after the money that's being avoided and evaded, uh, they should be able to raise uh, 15 or 20 billion uh, fairly easily. So 
Um, the other thing is that tax havens actually take money out of the country. So money that might otherwise be invested by companies in Canada gets shifted offshore and um, it's lost to our economy. Um, so it does drag down our economic growth as well. And it exacerbates income inequality because just like tax cuts, tax havens also facilitate the wealthy uh, hiding their money or keeping their money and uh, not paying taxes. Now, one encouraging sign is that uh, because of the Panama Papers and the um, Paradise Papers and all the media we've been able to get on this issue, public opinion has really shifted in Canada. And in the fall, we did a public opinion poll um, and found that 90% of Canadians uh, said the use of tax havens by large Canadian corporations to avoid paying taxes in Canada is morally wrong, even if it is currently legal. And 87% said the government should change the law to make the corporate use of tax havens illegal. So that's a huge public support. And it means even conservative voters, many of them, do support us on this issue. And even uh, Pierre Poliev was saying he would support Canadian government action on uh, limiting corporate use of tax havens. So there is broad public support on this. So what are the solutions? Well, some of the solutions are being worked at at the global level. The OECD has had what's called the base erosion and profit shifting uh, project going on. So they have implemented a number of uh, new policies, and the Canadian government has adopted them. Uh, some of them are, were in the last two federal budgets. Uh, one of them is country-by-country country reporting. So all corporations will have to report on how much taxes they pay in each country. Um, and what their profits were in each country. So that's a step forward. Um, and uh, they will be renegotiating some of the tax treaties, especially with tax haven countries that actually facilitate com companies uh, using tax havens. Um, so there is some reforms there happening. And uh, they are bringing forward um, other, other proposals that the Canadian government has not adopted yet. For example, on taxing uh, e-commerce. And John Anderson has done some work on this issue. Um, most other countries in Europe and Japan and you know, Australia, other places, have implemented reforms to actually tax companies like Google and Facebook and Netflix who don't have a physical presence in Canada and yet are capturing over 60% of the online ad ad advertising market, for example, and undermining Canadian newspapers and broadcasters and leading to all kinds of job losses and even closures of newspapers. And yet the Canadian government has done nothing to reform tax laws to say you're doing business in Canada, even if you don't have a big you know, office tower, you're in the Canadian market and you should be paying taxes and level the playing field with other Canadian companies. So there, there are areas internationally where Canada is still lagging behind. But there are other things that Canada can do uh, on their own. They don't need to wait for the OECD. Uh, the OECD... Their initial proposals on the BEPS were quite surprisingly good. Uh, many of the recommendations that the tax justice movement globally has been recommending were in there. But then, of course, they started getting watered down as the companies got involved in trying to... So the end result is a step forward, but not nearly as um, bold an action as we would need. And the other big problem with the OECD is it's a 
rich country club. So they really haven't addressed some of the major concerns of developing countries. And so we are now pushing for the UN to be uh, the main fora where tax issues can be debated because it's critical uh, to achieving the sustainable development goals to really um, get as much domestic resource mobilization as possible for developing countries to raise the revenue needed to invest in health and education and other development efforts. And that can't happen if um, all their mining companies are you know, shifting their profits out and they can't get <laughs> the value of the minerals uh, that are being extracted. In Zambia, for example, copper, um, many of the mining companies were doing exactly the same thing as Cameco was doing. Uh, selling to intermediaries and, you know, booking their profits offshore. So we need a much better international efforts, and Canada should be supporting uh, the move to, to shift the discussion over to the UN where all countries can be involved and address some of the tax reform issues that are most important to developing countries. But another thing that Canada can do on its own um, is enacting a couple of laws. There is, in fact, a private member's bill put forward by Murray Rankin, uh, the NDP member from uh, Victoria, called the Economic Substance Law. And it would require there to be real economic substance for any offshore subsidiary to be considered a separate legal entity for tax purposes. Does that make sense? It's kind of a no-brainer. I mean, these are fictional corporations. There's nobody often even in the office there. They're just on paper. So why should they be given legal status when there's nothing to it? It's just a tax avoidance scheme. And other countries have enacted this kind of legislation. Uh, and we're hoping to try to build some all-party support uh, for this bill. Um, and where there are legitimate investments in Barbados, you know, resort or something, that would be fine. But if it doesn't meet the test of having real economic substance, then it shouldn't be counted as a separate entity. Another thing Canada used to have is a cap on interest payments to offshore subsidiaries that could be deducted. Um, it got eliminated during the Harper era. So we're calling for that to be reinstated, especially for big resource companies. That's one of their favorite tactics to game the system. And uh, we had that before. We should reintroduce that. And we really need to um, renegotiate some of our treaties that actually facilitate tax evasion um, and uh, tax profit shifting. So. Those are things that Canada can do themselves. One other thing that we are really pleased about, and it's going to happen now, we've been calling for a tax gap report. We don't even know officially what the size of the problem is. And other countries, uh, periodically, not every year, but every number of years, they do what's called a tax gap analysis to look at where are the areas where there's the most leakage in the tax system. Is it the plumbers who don't charge GST? Is it companies that use offshore subsidiaries? Uh, is it, you know, underground um, criminal activity? Like, we don't know. Whereas other countries look at that kind of a, a study to enable them to pinpoint enforcement efforts more efficiently, to realize, okay, here's the biggest problems are here, that's where we should put our efforts. In the absence of that, the CRA has been going after small-time tax cheats, often cases where people don't even know that they did something wrong. They forgot to report something that, you know, a, a pension from the UK that they hadn't thought, oh, that's reportable. 
and nailing people like that because it's much easier. You don't have to fight long, drawn-out court cases like with chemical. But they need to do a tax gap report and find out where the problem is. What we're really pleased about is we finally got CRA to provide the Parliamentary Budget Office with the data they would need to be able to do that report. And if the Parliamentary Budget Office does it, it's an independent body that's you know, going to be more impartial and uh, should produce a good report. So we are making some progress, but we still have huge challenges in terms of getting companies to pay their, their way. And companies benefit a lot from uh, the taxes that get invested in education. They need trained workers in infrastructure. They need roads and railroads and stuff to be able to ship their goods. Um, and even health care is very important. That's a, an advantage for Canada. And, you know, we can't compete on the lowest taxes anywhere. We are much better able to compete on having a highly educated workforce, on having quality infrastructure, and um, those are more important than the tax rate for whether investment is going to come into Canada. And if we want good quality jobs, uh, it's more likely to be attracted by having quality education and quality uh, programs in place. That will make us more attractive. So it is also important for our competitiveness to figure out what is it that we have a competitive advantage on, and it's not taxes. Well, I think I'll stop there. Um, I think there's some time for questions. Uh, and I can open up other areas if you're interested related to taxes. I'd be happy to discuss. Thank you very much, uh, Dennis. Before I throw the floor open, I'll abuse my prerogative as chair to ask the first question. Um, I'm, I'm so glad you brought up the issue of developing countries. Both of us come from a developing yeah. country sort of perspective. Um, in the case of developing countries, do they not suffer uh, proportionately much more from tax evasion? Uh, if you look at uh, you know, how much uh, resource and other companies are not paying, and you compare that, for example, with what these countries are receiving in foreign aid, it, it's huge orders of magnitude of difference. If, if they were to actually capture all the taxes that should be paid, uh, that would dwarf the amount of uh, ODA that they're, they're getting. So. Uh, do you have any sort of um, insight on, on that? And the, the other related question is um, many of the uh, perpetrators are Canadian mining companies, as you said. Is there a way that the Canadian authorities can bring pressure to bear on the mining companies to make them better corporate citizens in, in the developing countries? Um, well, yes, for developing countries, the corporate tax is actually a much larger percentage of their revenue. So in Canada, because of all the corporate tax cuts, corporate taxes only bring in about 25%, I think, if I remember correctly, of our revenue. It's gone down. It used to be about 50-50, you know, income tax and corporate tax. But now it's down to about 25%. And that's true of many developed countries. The corporate tax has... Um, gone down. But in developing countries, uh, corporate tax uh, can be 40 or 50 percent of total revenue. So when companies are evading or avoiding taxes, it's a much bigger problem. And the other problem is uh, the very, you know, there's a lot more income inequality in many developing countries. And so the very wealthy are able to hide their money offshore in uh, tax havens, and that's very difficult. Uh, I mean, Canada has a hard time tracking that kind of stuff down. It's even more difficult for developing country tax administrations to uh, track that down. And this means that um, there, and it's true, because of, you know, flat, flattened aid, uh, aid going to developing countries, 
they're increasingly relying for their development program on their own resources. But there's a huge challenge because the easiest way to raise revenue for developing countries is the value-added tax. But it's a regressive tax. And so you have a perverse situation where the, the woman, you know, selling cigarettes and, you know, beer and so on in the stall on the street is paying more taxes than the tobacco companies and the brewery companies. You know, they've done studies in uh, Ghana, for example, uh, showing exactly that. So in order for tax administrations to raise the revenue in a way that is not going to exacerbate um, income inequality, then you've got to uh, move the tax revenue beyond just the value-added tax. They need to institute uh, income taxes, property taxes, wealth taxes, and they need to ensure that corporations are paying their fair share. Now, we've had some good uh, dialogues with the Canadian government on this question. In fact, yesterday I met with Global Affairs staff to discuss tax justice issues related to the Sustainable Development Goals. So I'm hopeful that Canada will support uh, some of these efforts globally. Uh, Canadians for Tax Fairness is part of the Global Alliance for Tax Justice. Uh, we have um, national campaigns in, um, I think it's 47 countries all around the world. Uh, we're very active at the UN. Right now, there is the uh, financing for development meetings going on, and uh, my colleagues are there <laughs> um, adv advocating for a global tax body under the UN. Uh, there's also a, a report being released on Friday on uh, the gender impact of value-added taxes. Uh, so we are very active at the international level on these issues. And I'm hopeful on this one that the Canadian government will be supportive. Um, and we're even going to try to approach them about funding some civil society uh, work on gender and tax justice. Uh, they've said gender is a big thing, and Canada's at this last federal budget said, you know, they want to promote gender budgeting for Canada, and they want to promote it internationally. So we're hoping to be able to uh, put forward a project that might get funded. We have to work with Oxfam or Interparis or some other a Canadian NGO to develop a a proposal, but the initial meeting, they were quite interested and enthusiastic, so I'm hoping that something will come of that. I'm interested particularly in light of next month's talk on uh, crime prevention and violence reduction, yep. that you didn't mention that as a, fa as a comparative advantage, because uh, I think it relates directly to the sustainable development goals in developed and uh, less developed countries, and uh, so I'm very interested in the link between implementation of the social development goals, which do include violence reduction yep. and prevention, and how you would, uh, what comments you would have on that. Well, it's true that Canada is, uh, you know, less violent society and so on, but in terms of corruption, we're actually pretty bad. We're known as the snow washing destination in the world. And this came out in the Panama Papers, where the law firm, where the, you know, the source of the leak, were advising their clients, go set up a shell company in Canada. You can open a numbered company in any province or territory you don't have to disclose who your, the real owner is. Uh, you can keep it all secret. And uh, nobody will find out. And this is a huge problem in Canada. And it's another issue that we're working on. We're campaigning for a public registry of beneficial ownership of corporations. So the UK has one. 
The EU has just decided that all EU members need to introduce a public registry of beneficial owners. Um, you know, when you go get a library card, you have to show your ID. When you register a company, you don't even have to show any ID of who you are. And um, even though we have what's called FinTrack, fi financing uh, and terrorist financing, no, money laundering and ter terrorist financing, we have a law against that. And I was just in uh, the Finance Committee last week <laughs> testifying about the uh, periodic review of this legislation. So it requires that banks uh, monitor any transactions over $10,000 and report that and, you know, any suspicious transactions, they investigate and so on. But in Canada, most of the money laundering happens through real estate. Guess where? <laughs> Vancouver and Toronto. Um, and so huge sums of money are coming into Canada, creating a bubble in the real estate market, which is negative impact in terms of affordable housing. But we're the number one place for laundering money in the world. And so the last uh, federal budget committed the government to reform of the beneficial ownership system. But in Canada, you can register a company in any province or territory, and about only 10% of companies are registered federally. So they've got to get everybody to agree <laughs> on this. So we've been working, lobbying uh, different governments. We've got the BC government really strongly supportive because they've got the huge problem of Vancouver real estate. And so they become champions on this. Um, and I think there is growing support at the political level. Uh, the Finance Committee uh, seemed very receptive to our recommendations. But when we met with the civil servants, in, they're kind of doing the minimalist necessary to, you know, to very moving very slowly on this. So it's a bit frustrating. Uh, but it is an area where Canada is actually... Um, and the reason why this has, you know, the Canadian government has taken uh, steps to try to do something about it federally is because when Bill Morneau goes to the uh, G20 finance minister's meeting, he comes under a lot of pressure because the Chinese government is worried about all the money that's being taken out illegally from China and laundered through Canada. Now, a lot of the Chinese money is not necessarily proceeds of crime. It's just there is a limit, you know, on how much money you can take out of the country. And so the people are breaking the law by finding ways to get their money out. Um, a lot of the money coming from Russia is questionable. <laughs> and from other sources, it often is proceeds of crime. So it's, you know, various kinds of money. But he has been embarrassed by the fact that, you know, Canada is a real laggard. In fact, Transparency International just released a report uh, last week on this. And Canada is dead last of all the countries in the world in terms of uh, beneficial ownership. So we have a lot to do in that regard. And I've talked to RCMP and uh, people in the banks and so on, and yeah, it's pretty serious. The estimate is about up to $60 billion of money is being laundered in Canada. $60 billion. That's a lot. I like your reference to transparency. Yep. And I'm struck by uh, an American rule for individuals, which requires them to report all their income anywhere in the world. Yeah. And it strikes me that if Canadian companies or, or international companies 
were forced to report by country yep. all their profits yep. and then only claim a tax credit for you know low tax rates that there would be some advantages to that do you want to Comment on that? Well, that is actually something that is being implemented. So the last federal budget actually uh, has, you know, announced that Canada will be implementing the country by country reporting regime. So it it hasn't started yet. It hasn't been put in place yet. But they've announced that it will be uh, coming. And there'll be adequate supervision of that. Well, <laughs> we'll have to wait and see. Um, but this is another reason why it's so important that this information be public. Right now, we've, the Canadian government has agreed they need a beneficial ownership registry, but they're not committing to it being public. They think, oh, we just make that information available to tax authorities and, um, and law enforcement. That's good enough. But you know what? Journalists in civil society play a key role in examining these issues and getting to the bottom of and identifying suspicious cases that need to be investigated. And you can't just leave it up to the RCMP or the Canada Revenue Agency. You've got to have uh, this information be available. And... You'll never get to the bottom of this if you're just relying on enforcement. You need to have deterrence. Right now, your chances of getting caught are zilch. So why wouldn't you? If you're a company, um, so many companies, they say, okay, we're doing all this legally. But you know what? A lot of them cross the line a little bit. They know if they cross the line a little bit, they can get away with it. And their chances of getting nailed only, you know, if you're a chemical and you cross the line a big amount, then, yeah, you'll get nailed. But a little bit here and there, it's like driving, you know, 10 kilometers over the speed limit. You know you're safe. <laughs> but if you're 30 kilometers over, you might get nailed, right? So the same thing happens with corporations. And they know, they do a calculation. They actually calculate, okay, the risk is this much, but we could make this much more money by shifting profits this way. And they do this calculation. And if the profits outweigh the risk, then they go ahead with it. And so that happens all over the place. Now, one of the other things I think we have succeeded in doing is change the risk calculation. Because guess what? Now Canadians are much more aware about tax havens. It has increased the reputational risk of corporations. So you know what a couple of the banks did? They actually, now it's not illegal to have an offshore account in a bank in the Caribbean, for example, and all the Canadian banks, they were the pioneers of the offshore banking system. The Canadian banks were the pioneers globally of the offshore banking system. But I think it's two banks, and I can't remember. I think it was Bank of Montreal and maybe Scotiabank. Anyway, two of them actually contacted their uh, account holders and said, can you show us proof that you have reported your account to the Canada Revenue Agency? So it's not illegal to have an account in an offshore bank, but you are required to report that on your, C on your tax return. So have you done that for your offshore uh, account? <laughs> Every single penny. <laughs> <laughs> and they actually closed a third of the accounts because their clients could not provide information. And the bank felt, okay, technically it's up to the account holder to make that disclosure to the CRA, but they could be on the hook for facilitating tax evasion if they didn't do the due diligence to make sure their clients were doing this. So we have made some steps forward, but, and this shows the power of 
transparency of getting information out there and making people aware. And yeah, we are making some progress, but it's still a huge problem. Uh, thank you, Dennis, for a fascinating and, and, and timely presentation. This, this has been really intriguing. I am disappointed, however, because I expected when I came here today to get from you a how-to manual, how, how I could protect what little money I have before I file next Monday. <laughs> <laughs> however, however, I do have a question. Um, you mentioned the global movement for tax fairness yeah. several times. Could you give us some sense of the architecture of that? How is it structured? How does it operate? Um, uh, is it comparable to other major civil society movements yeah. for different issues? And is there, within that, is there a particular poster child country where tax fairness uh, could be looked to with some envy from, from our side? Uh, yeah, well, this is something that um, I have been intimately associated with. When I first started at the uh, Canadians for Tax Fairness, and you know, I inquired and I got on the board of the Tax Justice Network, it was called then, um, I found at my first meeting that there was a lot of tension between north and south, which is not unusual. Any of you who've been involved in the global level know. Um, and there was a bit of a history where Tax Justice Network had gone ahead and taken a position without fully consulting all the network, and they're based in the UK, and so they have a certain perspective. But in their defense, you know, there were only two people operating out of a small, you know, garden shed in the backyard of one of the, of John Christensen, who I think spoke to your group before. He's the founder. So they didn't have the capacity to be able to properly consult and engage and support a whole global network. So there were a lot of tensions. Anyway, um, as a result, they... Uh, they had a, a big global meeting in Lima, Peru. And as the new kid on the block who had no history with any of this, I was asked to chair and facilitate the meeting that actually decided to set up a separate global alliance for tax justice out of the Tax Justice Network. And the Tax Justice Network now is primarily focused on research and some advocacy. And we still, even though we're independent organizations, there are close ties. But the Global Alliance for Tax Justice is, may, is an alliance of regional networks. So there's North America, which is just Canada and the U.S. But there is quite a strong network in Europe and in Asia and in Africa and in Latin America. So the... The five regions each appoint two people to a, a global coordination committee, and I'm one of the ones on that, and I actually serve as the treasurer for the organization. And so a lot of the work is done at a regional level, but the Global Alliance is involved in the global campaigning, like at the UN or the OECD. Uh, and recently, IMF and the World Bank have actually got quite engaged in tax issues. And given my history on the debt issue in developing countries, IMF, who are historically been the bad guys, on the tax issues, they're actually more progressive than the OECD and have been a bit of an ally. And there are problems with other parts of the IMF, but at least on the tax area, the IMF has been quite good. So we're engaging at that global level, and we're facilitating exchanges between the different uh, regional networks. So we have working groups. We have a working group on gender and tax justice that meets by conference call monthly, has had an international conference, has put forward uh, different uh, papers and um, work at UN and other uh, fora. We have a resources taxation, so mining and uh, oil and gas, a resources taxation working group. We have a working group on, on um, transparency and beneficial ownership and issues like that. We have a working group on 
on uh, carbon taxes, uh, on working group on progressive taxation, how to shift away from value-added tax. So we're facilitating all of these networks, which include civil society groups in developing countries, as well as some of the big INGOs, the Oxfams and the Christian Aids and the um, Action Aids, you know, some of the big international NGOs. So the Global Alliance um, mainly gets its funding from some of the big development agencies and the Ford Foundation, Open Society Foundation, uh, and some of the other major uh, foundations. There are some in Europe as well as in the United States. Uh, so tomorrow I have a call with the Ford Foundation to see if we're going to get our next two years of uh, funding. But, yeah, no, they've been very supportive. So we've got now a staff of five globally. So one in each region. <laughs> and each regional staff has a regional networking responsibility as well as uh, – a subject area responsibility. So our Africa regional person is the one in charge of supporting the gender and tax justice work. So each staff has a dual uh, responsibility. And we meet monthly, and we try to meet face-to-face -face once a year. I mean, we're still pretty small organizations, but I would say we've been very influential at a global level. I mean, we're, you know, I was in New York uh, in February for what's called the Platform for Collaboration on Tax Justice. It brought the UN, OECD, IMF, World Bank, and all the governments together. And they had various panels and discussions. And on not every, but most panels, there was a civil society person from our network who, you know, provided that perspective as part of the discussion. So, and we had our own uh, board member, Allison Christians, who's a tax law professor at McGill, who's on the Canadians for Tax Fairness board. She addressed the plenary on why we need to move away from the arm's length rule, which is so hard to prove. Like when most trade, or half more than 60% of trade, is between companies, related companies, how do you? ensure that it's being transacted on the basis of an arm's length relationship. You can't. And she made a very compelling presentation about how the way the OECD determines the value assigned to uh, administration of companies means that a disproportionate amount of the profit and then taxes get paid in developed countries. And developing countries lose out big time as a result of these accounting uh, rules. And so it really created a buzz. Like, you know, the Nigerian finance minister came up to me and said, who is this Canadian woman who's championing developing country, you know, reworking of the rules to favor developing countries? So Canadians have a good reputation still in that regard. <laughs> and I think, yeah, no, I've been involved in various international organizations. And it is important that in many cases, the Canadians are the ones that are able to bridge the north-south tensions that often come up. And yeah, that's, that still continues. Yeah. Yeah, uh, well, thank you very much for a really interesting presentation, Dennis. And I like you, the fact that you mentioned the e-commerce e issue. And I just wanted you to comment a bit more on that because what, what, what is uh, troubling me is that, you know, it's not just the fact that we're losing all this tax revenue. It's, as you said, it's the fact that we, we are losing our newspapers in terms of how, you know, the voice of the newspapers. We're losing our culture with Netflix, et cetera. And uh, we also have a situation now where uh, even banking is now switching to the internet uh, with all the different apps from Apple to, I mean, I've got about three of them 
apps, which 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 I don't use them, but I mean, which which have been offered to me in terms of you know banking apps, which are not run by banks. They're run by 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 Samsung. They're run by Apple. They're run by Google, and and so the large part of the banking is now going to switch into this sort of offshore situation where we won't even be able to monitor that, yep. uh, let alone. And I mean, I and I wonder, you know. Just if you could talk a bit about that, and what are some other countries doing around this, uh, around the, the e-commerce uh, issue? Well, this is an area, again, where Canada really is a laggard. Um, and, you know, so much of, of the economic activity has shifted to the online world. And, you know, it's, it's in the cloud. It's somewhere up there. But... The OECD actually has sent out guidance that they should be taxed according to the sales they generate in each country. And so uh, there is, you know, a proposed solution on this, and it's been internationally negotiated and agreed to. And I don't understand why Canada isn't moving forward like other countries have. And... Even within, this is one where I just feel, well, I've got a lot of interaction with finance department officials. On this one, they seem to agree with me. I think it's political lobbying, and there's been evidence recently that Facebook and uh, Netflix have had former deputy ministers or high senior ser uh, servants of uh, who've been hired away as the lobbyists for these companies who have direct access at a top political level that have short-circuited logical thinking. <laughs> and um, that's the only explanation I can come up with. Um, I don't understand it because even, even at the finance committee last fall when I gave testimony on this issue, I felt majority of the members on the committee were very supportive. So I don't know what the, but it's just that Google and Netflix and Facebook have really had their connections at a very senior level with this government. And this government thinks, while they have this image of themselves as being science friendly and innovation and high tech and you know, whereas the conservatives were associated with the oil industry and, you know, kind of the resource, the liberals are the high tech sector. And so they want to encourage, you know, Google and uh, Amazon and others to invest in Canada. So that's why they're treating them with kid gloves. Um, that's the only explanation I have on that. Okay, well, it's, it's good to know that in some respects um, Canada is uh, a laggard as well as a leader because uh, Canadians can get awfully smug sometimes. But in the leadership area, I mean, it, it's really quite remarkable what uh, Canadians for tax fairness have done under Dennis's leadership. And, <laughs> and just three staff. So uh, kudos to you. Uh, you make us proud. And yes, let's try and feel a bit happier about filing our taxes, uh, and, and let's get our governments to fill in the forms. <laughs> Thank you for coming, and I'll see you in another month. This podcast would not be possible without the help of some key people. Music by Christian Whalen, technical support and production by Sarah Bowles. If you have any questions or comments, please email group. 78 at group78.org.